Does that mean we're ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'd like I'd like to welcome everybody to the first webinar in the series of webinars that Yad Sarah is holding. Uh, this one is when staying home is not staying safe. Uh, let me give you a couple of words on Yad Sarah for those of you who don't know. It's the leading volunteer organization in Israel. It provides uh, an incredible network of individuals. There are over 7,000 volunteers and over 100 centers where these services are provided. Uh, it doesn't just serve the elderly as many people think, it serves people of all ages. Um, the impact is wide ranging. It's kind of known for the wheelchair lending, but there are a whole lot of other uh, items mm -hmm. and products that are loaned out. Um, and it allows people to remain at home and not be hospitalized. <clears throat> and uh, just to give you an idea how big it is, over 600,000 people were served by Yad Sarah last year. So let's get started and talk about the effects of quarantine and domestic violence. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Pam Wolf. I was a public health service officer uh, with the US government for 20 plus years and I've been working in women's health for over 30 years. What's women's health? Well, I did contraceptive development, menopause, family planning, HIV AIDS, toxic shock, you name it. Um, today, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Shoshana Friedman, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Executive Director of the Shalom Task Force here in New York, and Dr. Shlomi Lehman, Director of the Family Center. Director of the Hello, I hear noise, okay. Uh, director of the Family Center at Yad Sarah in Jerusalem. So I'd like to ask our panelists each to take a minute and just describe their background in education and the organization that they are part of, and then we'll get going. Um, Shana, you wanna begin? Sure, thank you so much, Pam. I wanna start with thanking Yad Sarah for asking me to join you this afternoon or morning or evening, I guess it matters where you are, um, which is the beauty of Zoom, right? I'm Shana Friedman. I'm the executive director of Sham Task Force, and I'm just excited to be here. This is a very important conversation. Um, I'm excited to learn more about what's going on in Israel because I'm based in New York and we're still sheltering in place. Um, and so we have a lot to learn to what, what's going to be our future. So I, I'm happy to be here for that. Um, I am a clinical social worker. I have a PhD in social work. I'm a clinical social worker. And I worked on the front lines of domestic violence my whole career, so around 18 years, 19 years now. Um, mostly in the Jewish communities of New York, So I've certainly served the general communities, but my specialty has been working with Jewish women who are victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, 
um, sex trafficking, um, and working both as a clinician and in community programming. Um, and it's really a passion of mine to work at that intersection of, of community and clinical work, um, and how can we impact positive change. Um, I joined the Shalom Task Force at, as um, the executive director around two years ago. Um, it is, I always feel like I've been in, involved with Shalom Task Force, but I became officially part of the team two years ago. Um, and Shalom Task Force, for those who aren't familiar, is a national organization based in New York. Um, we serve all, but we really, we're here for the Jewish community to combat domestic violence and foster healthy relationships. Um, and we do that through three services. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important for people to know because you can help others find the services. There's our hotline, which is national and I'd say international. We get calls from all over. We make referrals all over, including to Yad Sarah. Um, we have our education program that goes into day schools, gap year programs in Israel, colleges and communities. Last year, we reached over 4,500 individuals around um, awareness and domestic violence. And our legal services program, where, which is New York based, where we, we represent, we have lawyers on staff that represent clients, victims of domestic violence, to go into court and to go into Beitzin to help people um, with remedies related to legal services. So that's the overview. Um, there's more on our website. So, so take a look and be in touch if you have any questions. And really, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Shlomi, can you do the same? Yes, I try. So first of all, I have to also be here and, uh, to, and to share with you um, what we are doing. Uh, I, ha I have a PhD in social work and clinic social work. I, I am the director of the uh, family center in Yad Sarai and I also established the center 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. Um, I, I have to say that in my background, uh, many things, but I was teaching in Bar Ilan University in the School of Social Work therapy for 15 years. I stopped it when I, when I went into establishing the center. After a few years, I understood that I can do both. And I, uh, I now am in the, in the center. Uh, you have to be patient with me because English is not my mother tongue. So some, <laughs> and I'm excited being with you. So sometimes I'm stuck with the words. So patient. Um, what I can say that I'm also so part of the subject that we're dealing tonight, I am uh, um, in the Forum Takana, if you know about, which deals with uh, uh, abusive relationship in the, in the educational uh, programs. And a few words which I want to share about our center. When we say family center, it means that we have a domestic violence treatment center, which uh, when we establish it, uh, the governmental the office decided that uh, there is a need here in the country that there will be a center, treatment center, that will be addressed and professionalized in the ultra-orthodox and related rel the Haredi and the T people here over the country. And that's the way we establish our, our center. We, when I started, we were two uh, uh, social workers. Now we have 13 social workers uh, working in this center. And the, we are treating the men, the women and the children, meaning uh, the, the victims, the abusers and the children who are witnesses and exposed to the violence in their parents. We have a younger brother-sister branch in Sderot, which is in the west side of the Negev uh, in, in Israel. And you know, it's a place which uh, from one moment to the other can be bombed and under terror. And uh, it's a young brother branch, but uh, we're very proud of them. Uh, what we give, the treatment that we give in our center is individual treatment, couple treatment uh, under, circums uh, uh, um, under specific circumstances. We have a lot of group work every week, at least 10 groups, which I don't have time to describe. And of course, we're doing a lot of community work. 
like I'm doing right now, but we're getting into high schools uh, to, to we work with the uh, rabbis and you know, more, more and more. I think it's enough for the time being. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, we're gonna have a discussion for maybe 45 minutes and then we're gonna leave a little bit of time at the end, like maybe 15 minutes for questions and answers. Feel free using the chat function on Zoom. Uh, isn't technology terrific? Um, you can send in your questions and answers and they'll be, com uh, sorry, questions, and they'll be compiled and sent to me and we'll leave some time at the end to ask some of those questions. The other thing I wanted to mention, oh, sorry, you should send them to Mayra Feynman. You'll see her name on the participants. Also, we'll have uh, this recorded. So once it's ready, we'll be able to send out recordings of the session if you're interested uh, in uh, receiving it. And if you have any friends who are interested in participating and they haven't registered, they can do so anytime or they can go on to Yad Sarah's Facebook page. So without any further ado, let's get going. Um, what I thought we would do first, because everybody who's listening is an expert on domestic violence, is have each of you just define what domestic violence is and if there are different kinds of domestic violence, just very, very briefly, and we'll just alternate. And Shana, you're on first on my screen, so <laughs> if you wouldn't sure. mind starting. With pleasure, with pleasure. I'm so appreciative that you're, you're saying that because so often when we have this discussion, people automatically think about physical violence, and that's the most obvious one. But when we talk about domestic violence or intimate partner violence, and we're talking about adults or teens in a relationship, I, I, we're not referring here, at least I won't be speaking about child abuse at this point. Um, what we're really talking about is a dynamic between two individuals where one person is obtaining and maintaining power and control over the other one through a pattern of behaviors. And the important message in that definition is about power and control and a pattern of behaviors. So physical is certainly the one we know best and is most fatal, um, but there are a number of other behaviors that we talk about. It's kind of the toolkit of what domestic violence, intimate partner violence is. It includes emotional, um, emotional psychological abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse that we see, um, spiritual abuse, technological abuse. I'm sure Shlomit has others to add, but it's behaviors where one party is using those behaviors to have power and control over the other party. Um, and often there will be no or just very few physical incidences, but there's certainly that dynamic in the relationship in which one person is controlled. Shlomit. Thanks, Shlomit. Yes, no, I think you mentioned uh, most of them. Another thing that I want to add, you, you were talking about the control which uh, leads the relationship, I think the fear. Yes. Is another. It's the other part of the same. It's a relationship between a couple, which one of them has a high level of uh, control because of various reasons, which we don't have time to get in, which are important to understand the problem. And the other, he. Uh, we're talking now about the women, but it can be also a man. Uh, uh, what leads him is the fear. He can't, what he's doing or not doing is because he is afraid that he will be hurt by the partner, emotional or physical. And so the fear is one of the very important uh, I think what you're saying is so uh, important. Uh, another thing which is so important, important here yeah. is the secret. The secret is the, the it, it's, it's around the, the problem because people most of the time they don't, the secret is inside and outside. The inside is the, all the def defenses the, that we know the, and the outside is they are not telling people what's happening. And even sometimes they're trying to make a nice uh, picture and, and our challenge is to, to, to break the secret that because of the secret uh, makes much, much harder. I think. And we know is abuse, I mean, it's so important when you said abuse really thrives in silence. 
And so, so activity like programs like this and programs that you offer and all, a lot of the colleagues I see online, um, it shatters the silence to make it possible for people to, to recognize what's going on and to get the help. And this idea of fear, you know, we, we speak to individuals and I'm sure it's similar for you and you're kind of almost a diagnostic tool is the difference between a high conflict um, couple and a couple that's involved, there's an abuse is that component of fear. And I appreciate you bringing that up because you know, in a high conflict, there might be some of the same behaviors, but it isn't one person on the other one. There isn't this level of like, do I have to duck? Am I afraid? Where we, you know, we're working with our abusive, you know, you know, victims of abuse, there is always that level of fear. Um, and and I think another thing we have to add that you, that the a man can be a violator and a victim. Yes. A woman can be a violator and a victim. The children, even they, even if they have, are violators, we always consider them as uh, victims because nobody was born. Their background uh, has to do with it. Another thing, may, maybe that is important to mention, that the, we we see a high percentage of a, a of a, the problem going through the generations. That if you have a couple the, and the children uh, were um, were in, saw the relationship, and that's what they know. The 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 it's, it's a very high level of possibility that they in when when they will grow up they will be or a violator or a foe. We have to put a lot of effort in tutoring in and 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 help these children in order to break it and they will the the pathology won't go on through the generations. Okay, um, I want since this is really. A discussion of domestic violence in the context of the quarantine or of COVID. I wanted to ask you both: um, Is domestic violence up? Are you seeing more of it? What was it like before? What was, what is it like now? Um, Shana, you want to go first, or do you have um, anything to say? <laughs> I was going to defer to Shlomit first. Um, you know, they're out of okay. quarantine. But go, go ahead, show me, and I'll, I'll add. Okay. Yeah. So uh, because of the fact that when we are talking about domestic violence, it's not something that starts because of uh, of any anxiety. It, it, it is a language. It's something that, that because of reasons that, as I said, that we can mention now, uh, the this is the language in the family, in, in the family who suffers from domestic violence. So it doesn't, the corona doesn't bring the domestic Violence. As every as every stressor, we see that if some if, if something happens, then the the language that we are used to raise and gets more. So therefore, I think we say we see nowadays, which wasn't in the first in the beginning two months, we see more refers. But in the beginning, the the there were reports to the to the police, there were reports to the welfare agencies, but there were people who as I, I may say that they were shouting they are suffering at home because of the corona and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll point some of the, of the reasons, but uh, they weren't uh, actually, uh, they didn't want treatment. They, they, they asked, they wanted to, to say their, their problem, but they didn't get into any uh, kind of uh, process of treatment. Now, after the, after two, three months, when things are a little better now we have a floating of, of, of now it's really tough and but I, I i want to share and to say that during the time of the of the corona to the beginning of the two months of the corona uh, we really uh, what we did was we put all of our work in the center into uh, the digital work from in two days, we took the whole center from face-to-face uh, -face, uh, treatments and put it on digital. And it's not so easy uh, uh, to deal with the ultra-orthodox because not everybody has internet and cell phone, only one cell phone in, any, in, in the family and so on. But we really had for in every 
a week over 160 treatment hours of treatment of, of patients. So the group works, the individual, and, and I had a real nachat. I was so satisfied because, you know, in every day I'm asking myself, everybody I think of us asking whether our efforts uh, uh, of the treatment to exceed. And I saw that all of our family, they felt kept. They felt that they had the tools to, to manage with the problem of domestic violence in the corona time. And they have an address and they can stay with the question and with the problems and to wait to the therapist. And if they needed, they called him before. And, and, and there were no explosions with our hundred, over 160 clients. They knew they were the they way. So uh, that's that was very all the difference between those who has treatment and those outside didn't have treatment and they really had much more tough uh, time. Uh, how about China? Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been, so we're still in lockdown. I escaped today to a friend's eight empty office, so my children didn't join us. But I think most people here um, are probably joining us from home, and we all experience a level of stress, even in healthy enough relationships. But the relationships we're talking about, I, I, I agree with um, Shlomi, we're, they don't jump from being healthy enough relationships to being a domestic violence relationships, right? It's a pattern of behaviors and there's an escalation. And that's what we're seeing. Our hotline, the first two or three weeks of the lockdown here in New York and the, the you know close areas, it was very quiet. Um, and I just, I mean, I, I don't think it needs to be said, but it does just every time I think about the idea that um, how do you call a hotline um, when your abuser's in the next room? Like, this, like very like practically speaking, how do you do that? And then if you're just dealing with what we're all dealing with, like adjusting our whole lives, Zoom school for your kids, managing how to get groceries, just basic needs right now, how do you reach out for help? Since I'd say Passover, it's been our regular traffic, not increased. But what's been interesting with our, our statistics is uh, typically we get 40% um, of our calls are from friends and family. Um, asking how to be helpful. Right now, 87% um, of our calls are from the actual victims. So, you know, we're trying to understand that um, somehow they are calling. Often it's when the, you know, our calls are usually from persons at work or the abusers at work. Now it's with a bathtub running in the background. It's when they're at the grocery store for, you know, a half hour out during the, you know, during the day. Um, they're quicker calls, but there's a higher, the higher reporting of physical violence. So there is this escalation from maybe verbal, physical, non-physically -vi violent behaviors to physically violent behaviors. And I think we understand in similar ways, um, there are so many risk factors. We don't say that this is the reason why domestic violence happens, but there's the introduction of many risk factors, financial uncertainty and um, more exposure to the abuser being stuck inside, um, just in heightened anxiety and depression and mental health issues. It's basically the perfect storm perfect storm for family violence um, to happen. So, you know, I'm, I'm on some committees and citywide committees, and we keep on calling it the pandemic within the pandemic, what's happening um, right now. Um, and that's what we're seeing. Um, our numbers have not shot up um, significantly um, in volume, but they have increased in the level of physical violence. Um, and that's very concerning. Um, and you know, we're now figuring out what's going to happen in the future. And, I, I'm going to look towards my colleague for that, but um, that's what I, we're seeing right now. Okay, mm -hmm. let me ask you. I have to say that we don't see increase in, in the physical terms, uh, very much in the emotional terms. And maybe uh, to, to add something which are more uh, specific to, the, to our clients and the population that I'm addressed to, that you know, the, the houses of uh, our Times, most of the time without any gardens or even porches and when you are locked in and there are more than five children uh, mm -hmm. uh, around and uh, you know in, in the house of the Haredi, the ultra-orthodox, the, the, many of the boys are studying out of the house and they are in dormitories and now from one, one moment to the other all the, the children were sent home even from the States, some of them were sent home back. 
and the whole family was again together and even some of these children do not have a bed in their house because they are coming only for Sukkot and Pesach and all of a sudden they came and they didn't know until when. And another problem that some of the, the them in our families, these some of them, the children were abusers in their house and they were sent away to other places and nowadays they came. So the victim there was there, the abuser was there for one moment. And to the who are not in so good condition of relationship to begin with, and all of this with the fear from being sick, from debt, from being dead, from what will be if they will be unemployed, and, and so on and so forth. So all of these circumstances are raising the the the, the stress and are raising the the violence. But as I said, we didn't find that there was a raise about the physical, much, much more about the, the emotional. Okay, well, both of you have touched on this, but I read that experts were concerned because there were fewer calls. I don't know if each of you have experienced it, but in general, there were fewer calls and they thought, well, maybe this uh, suggested that uh, people were unable to call to get help if they needed it. So I'm just going to ask each of you, uh, what are the impediments to reporting and what do you recommend for circumventing this to get around the problem of reporting? Whoever wants to go first, go ahead. <laughs> Say what I think. Shlomit, can you want to go first? Yes, so I, 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 I actually, my, you know, the super, the supervisions in the municipality and in the welfare uh, agents, they were very much concerned. I understood what's happening and I assume, you know, also because when there are the holidays, we don't have the calls. When we have the calls, it's in the day after the holidays. So I, if I can compare, I, I was very, I, I understood and I, to say I, I, that what do we have? We have a hotline 24 seven, uh, which is open and was open. It's, it's open all the time, but it was open also, especially in the Corona time. So in every minute of the day, anybody could call us and we came and we called back immediately. Also, we have a, a, a special a, a program with the police, which is everyday program, but it became in, to, in the corona time much deeper problem. If we suspect about the problem of a woman or in a family, we can tell the police, the police that the path was the, 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 the cars of the police will go next to the house more than uh, as usual. And also we give the woman a specific number that it's a direct number that doesn't, she doesn't have to dial hundred. She has a, a number that she can call and they answer and they know to identify that it's her when they get the call. And if, if there is a call and she's not talking, they know to say, it's an opportunity, but I have to admit that we didn't use it all over the corona time, but I, I slept much better that I know that if I need it, I have it. Uh, there was also what we call the uh, silent uh, messages. They, we, they, they, it was published that there is a sign that they don't have to call. They can uh, write a message and, and to say that they're in trouble. But we didn't hear that there was a lot of use of it, silent uh, 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 messages. Um, another thing is that in, in over the country, they, they, they gave us 118, which every woman could call. And we get the refers, the, the social workers who were, who were there to answer the 118 24 seven, they refer the people to us again. I got, uh, quite a uh, nice uh, a number of, uh, of the calls from 998, but most of them weren't ready for a treatment. They just wanted to talk to somebody and that's what we did. And to, to try to them. One, one of the things which, which helped in those days to help people to make a, a order in their, in their 
in the missions over the day that you have to get up, you have to, to give breakfast to the children, when are you cooking, when are you washing, uh, when are you learning and so on, and to help them and to talk to the men, to talk to the woman, but they didn't want, uh, they weren't uh, prepared to a real process of treatment, as I mentioned before, but these were the main thing that the answers, and of course, what I mentioned already, that we dig and which means when, when we digital all the treatment system means that if a woman said you know i can't talk to you i can't have the session the therapy session in in the ordinary time i need it to be at 10 o'clock at night or even at 11 because that's the time that the children are asleep and they can go sleep out from the house for a few months to the street in order to talk to you our workers did it they had the, the, the therapy time in, you know, in different, although they had their children also at home and, and it worked and it, and, and it gave the fruits. Sure. Yeah, I think you touched on a lot of what's going on. I mean, I mentioned before, how does someone call when the abuser's there? And that continues to be one of the issues nationally here. Not only the Jewish community, there are, there is a decrease in the beginning, there certainly was a decrease um, of calls to all the different hotlines, though there's different reports about the calls to the police. Like, it's unclear to us if the police are getting the same number of calls and making less reports. Um, is the abuse um, more? So people are calling the police. And you don't usually know in the moment exactly what's happening. But there, there are a lot of services that remain, remain available. Um, and we've done some things to try to help people reach out for help, even if it's not to us. Um, we, we partnered with another organization in the community called Amudim. They did an anonymous hotline and we trained all of their volunteers around safety planning. So they're all mental health practitioners, but perhaps not experts in domestic violence. And we trained them because it was a general like line about anxiety and just kind of what's going on at COVID where people are calling to just be heard. And perhaps that's more acceptable. It's easier to call a line um, needing to vent about and share your experience of, of Zoom school and then get to talk about domestic violence. And what they've reported to me is that that's what happens, that people will call talking about the, the pressures of, of what this is, this, this shelter in place, and then in the conversation, in a more hushed voice, they'll disclose domestic violence. <coughs> so that's one way we're trying to get, get the help out there, even if it's not directly through, through our agency. Um, and then there's um, other ways we're trying to help people. Um, we're doing a lot of online programs like this. And I, I thank people for coming to these programs because I think that um, we are ambassadors to others where you know, if we learn a little bit about how do you do a safety planning or making sure to stay in touch with people you consider more vulnerable than this time, creating code words, whatever we, we choose to do or able to do for others, then that's another way they can get their support. I think very much about the calls that we've gotten where people um, you know, consider, is it a time to leave a, a dangerous home when they're fearful of what it means to go into a shelter? Would they be exposed to COVID-19 there? Um, you know, and they're taking every precaution possible, but what that would feel to them to make that decision, uh, what would it mean to bring a police officer into the house? Is that introducing yet another way of infection all the, the anxiety around what corona is to people right now. So there's a lot to consider. Um, and, you know, we remain here to help people consider it. Um, it it's also, I don't know if you've seen this in Israel, but, but like the threat of evicting, um, I'd say the victim, mostly the women saying, you know, if you don't listen to me as part of the power and control, I'm gonna, you're gonna have to leave this house. Um, and you have nowhere to go and nobody can take you in right now, right? There's no, nobody's taking people in you know, um, is very frightening and very controlling right now. And we get calls like that. I, I got a call last night about that, um, where, you know, that's just yet another dynamic of how does Corona play into this dynamic of, of power and control. Um, so it's, it's unclear exactly what's happening um, and where the calls will be and then what will happen, hopefully when we're, I don't know if it'll be post COVID, I don't know what that's gonna look like, but at least when shelter in place is lifted, what the calls will be like um, here back in the States, um, how much more work we'll have to do and how much more we have we want to be able to offer people are there are the shelters open, open? are the shelters sorry. open? are the I'm shelters sure. open yeah i, I saw one of my colleagues on here from one of the shelters um yeah absolutely um esther asher from ohel is on um absolutely the shelters are open there a lot of them are at capacity 
Um, I'm, I'm involved in a city task force around this and they are taking intakes. Um, you know, it matters what's available, that's always the truth, but, but one of the right. issues is that people can't discharge from shelter, right? Because people aren't as easily finding places to go. So then you right. know, people right. in and out of shelter, which is a long process and in itself difficult, um, but it doesn't leave beds for the next family. And then there's a the fear of entering shelter, um, but the shelters are still open, the police are still responding. I mean, those, that basic essential infrastructure, you know, my, my most intimate knowledge is here in New York, in New York City, still exists. Um, but are people willing to access it? Are, is there other fear, right, going on that can I access that right now? Um, the same way as the court system is physically closed down or was for most time, but our lawyers are able to apply for remote orders of protection, restraining orders, right? You can do that. But do people know that? And is that another form of abuse where the abuser is saying, you know, you can do whatever you want. Nobody's going to get a restraining order now. Like you have no power. And, but yes, you do. You do have power. There is, there are still available things. Um, you know, there are available um, remedies available, but people don't know that, but yeah. Are there in either place, Israel or New York City, are there hotel rooms being made available for uh, victims of domestic violence? I know in some cities there are, I just don't know about New York. I've and heard it done, not through the city. I've heard it, I, I, I don't know the answer about the city. I do know that there are some um, private, people are doing that privately. Um, but not at a large scale, but I know that it is happening in the Jewish community privately. Because I, I read, and forgive me, I don't remember where I read it or what location, but I read that there were like 200,000 hotel nights being provided for domestic yeah. violence victims, but I, I'm, I really must apologize. Okay. Let me just well, here in Israel also all of the shelters are open and even the, the open, Another, uh, another shelter for Corona because, you know, because of the isolation and all the problems, you know, they couldn't bring in somebody who was in the community and uh, one have to be uh, uh, separated for two weeks and so on. So there, is, there was a problem. So from one day to another, they opened here a Corona uh, shelter. And uh, yes, unfortunately, I think that all of the shelters are, are full. Uh, yeah. But, but things are really under control. Things, things are treated. Although I have to mention lately, in those months of the corona, they were five women were murdered by, by their uh, husbands. And it, it, it makes the, 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 whole, the whole problem uh, much more worried about the domestic violence problem. And the day before yesterday, there was a big uh, demonstration here in Tel Aviv. So I, I don't know exactly the awareness and the, and the fear about domestic violence. It's, it's only because of the corona or because of, the, of those uh, murders that, that we had, unfortunately, lately. And it wasn't corona uh, murders. It, it, it was, you know, because of the situation in the in the families maybe part of the corona okay i i thought maybe we could before we go to questions and answers um, i think we could talk about what are some of the preventive measures that we can take and what can we do in our communities to help w either prevent this or help people who are suffering from this uh whoever wants to go first shana you want to go first Sure, I mean, preventive measures are always an interesting conversation. I mean, there's different <laughs> pockets, right? So right. my agency does a lot of work about, um, you know, awareness around domestic violence. We do a lot of work. Um, we do relationship skill building for couples. We call for young and not so young couples, so newlyweds. Um, we, we do a lot of just, you know, education. And one of the hopes is that the, the, the outcome of the education is that if someone there later feels that uh oh feeling or sees red flags, they call the hotline, we help connect them to the right services. So in some way that's prevention um, and risk management. Um, you know, I, I'm right now, <laughs> there's so much to talk about about prevention. Um, it sounds like Shulmeet does a lot more. Your agency is really in direct service um, and clinical direct service. That's not something that we offer as of right now. Um, we really re we rely on our, our partner agencies to refer to around um, prevention. There's a lot of work around that. I think the other prevention is just keeping the conversation on the forefront. Um, I, one thing, which is, I, don't, I hate saying positive outcome of Corona because it just feels weird to say that, but I will say one of the positive outcomes of, of this situation is that I feel like the, the community, at least in my experience, 
has been willing to talk about domestic violence. Um, there's, I've never gotten so many news inquiries and webinar invites um, as I have around this issue in the Jewish community than I have in the last three months. And I think there's something very um, jarring around hearing this idea is, are you safe at home? I think all of us at home relate to that feeling and feel blessed when we are safe at home. And to me, the po one positive outcome can be is that we have this conversation and we keep the conversation going post this emergency where victims and our survivor victims in our community know that we know it exists because that's such a big part of prevention and intervention is that we are seeing you. We see that people in all of our Jewish communities experience this. And when we don't talk about it, people in the community don't think that we're here for them. So that's one, one part of, I believe, is prevention and one part that we all are part of um, is to just keep this conversation going, you know, attend the webinars, read the articles, um, bring it to your synagogue, wherever you can bring this to so that people can spread the word that we see you and we're here for you. Um, those are some of my thoughts. Shlomit. Yes, I'll, I'll separate it in two because of the fact that we are actually the walk-in clinic. So, and, and I, I mentioned that we have a community work. So it's, I don't know whether in the clinic, it's not preventing, it's what, what we plan to, to deal with the, the situation. I have to, to, to say first that I'm very much concerned because, you know, uh, we are very, and we're, I, I am very anxious what will be about the money that we'll get because of the situation. So I know already, I got already today orders that I can't get more people because we have no money. So I'm very much concerned how, how will I be able to give the service. But what we do plan is, for instance, parenting a group work. In, because we saw that there was a, a, the percentage of the reports about uh, domestic uh, or with violence uh, to use increased uh, in 76 percent or something around the corona. So we want to to add more uh, parenting groups for the parents to know how to deal with the problems. I thought that we, and, and and started to work on having a, a therapy through art or psychodrama or uh, treatment uh, with music, which it helps because it, it, it works with bypasses the defense and maybe it will help the people to talk about the problems and to raise them. So that's what I, I'm willing to bring a, a workers in these two group, uh, work and for group work. Uh, what, uh, in the terms of the community work, what I'm doing, I did it yesterday, I'm doing it in the next week, I have uh, three sessions in high schools, in the, in the colleges. Yesterday I was in college in Gush Etzion for girls, and, and I have a few uh, high schools in next week to talk about the problem, to, to bring the awareness, to help them to, to identify the red lines, so that's the, the way of uh, preventing. Another thing which I am doing during the corona is to use the leaders in the communities. For instance, I had a Zoom a conference with the rabbis of all Torah stones from the rabbis all over the world, and we are willing to do more because I think the leaders, the rabbis, the, the, the teachers in the schools, they can, they, if they'll have the tools, they will, if we will teach them how to identify the, the, the persons with the problems, they can refer them to get treatment or help them. And there's a hope if they go to be treated. So working, give workshops to, to rabbis, how to identify, how to help the people to go to, to treatment and how to help them now with the, the financial things that increase the problem and so on and so forth. I think working with the, the teachers in the high schools or in the schools uh, as general and with the leaders of the community, the rabbis, is a very important thing to, to to work problem or helping the treating the people who are suffering in order to help the problem to be solved. Is it, look, this came in from someone in the audience, I believe. Um, 
is it harder to help or reach the uh, Orthodox community or to find shelters for uh, folks who are Orthodox? Does it make it more difficult? Shlomit. Oh, I'll tell you, if we were talking uh, 15 years ago, I may say yes, but it'll, it really work and, and, and we are not there anymore. I think that the uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, population here over the country, they, those one who need to know about us, know about us, and they, they are, I, I, I have to say that if in my center, we have the most large uh, uh, patient, men, uh, violators, men uh, treated m much more than three. So it means that we succeeded. When we have in our centers, the, the people who are, who are coming to the center, they're not coming through the welfare, most of them, half of them. Half of our clients are coming because a friend brings a friend. So it means that people in the community are talking and speaking about it. And, I, and I'm asking, how did you come? They said, in the synagogue, a man who, who sits uh, uh, next to me said, you know, I see you have a problem with your wife. Go to Yad Sar uh, so it's already people are talking about it, rabbis. Are, of course, there is still a lot to do, but uh, I, 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 j I feel that it's much, much better. But there is a lot to do, still a lot to do. Yeah, I mean, we're in a similar <laughs> position. I mean, um, you know, I, I work on the backs of many, many wonderful people in the community, women who have really made great headway in the Orthodox communities and I'd say the more insular communities. I mean, there are still challenges, and that's a lecture on its own. Um, when you work with more insular communities. And that's not only the Orthodox Jewish, so that's what we're talking about today. What are the barriers to them coming forward? How can we help them? You know, what do we understand so we can inform our treatment, our intervention, so that they work better in those communities? So certainly um, there are challenges, but there's much more recognition than there had been when, you know, I started, you know, 18 years ago. Specifically shelter, I have to say, um, you know, my first job, and I see my colleague Esther Asher from OL Children's Home is here. My first job was at their shelter. And that is a shelter that is kosher and it's um, available um, and it's funded by New York City. Um, and so there are shelters that, and there's one at Jewish Family and Service, Jewish Board. I think Faye Wilbur from Jewish Board is here. You know, there are shelters that accommodate the needs of, of a Jewish, um, a kosher family, which is a bit different in Israel because, you know, that's more available. We're here, you know, you'll have people who need to go to shelter, but they, they'll be in neighborhoods they're not, you know, that are not, um, close enough to, to yeshivas or day schools. They won't have access to kosher food. And how do you bridge that so that shelter can also help them remain in a community of origin and they don't have to give up their sense of belonging? Um, and we do that. I mean, we did that, you know, that's what we do on the front lines in our work is to how do we help people find solutions that could work for their families. Um, but there is, it's, I'm not going to say it's not challenging. There's only limited beds in those shelters and they're often full. Um, and we, we work very closely together. And that's why I, I point them out just because, you know, we really, it's like a DV family here in New York where we all work together for a very long time. And, you know, we'll know when there's an opening in a shelter and when we get a call, like we'll connect it fast. Uh, my legal department um, will work with the shelter workers at OHEL to make sure that everybody's getting what they need. So there's a real um, sense of, family and community and collaboration um, working in those in these communities um, and it's really important that we do that um, but really here in Israel we have two shelters which are addressed specific to the Haredi people and it works very good and also maybe I have to mention to add that we have a rabbinical committee next to the center uh, under very strict uh, rules that we are not getting into their uh, area we're not uh, dealing with the halachic things that's their right. area and national uh, decisions and we cooperate very nice and it's it's very helpful about uh, referring people to get this temple that we are kosher and uh, also they they can help in the in you we are doing the the professional work but they are helping us with the with the leadership work. And so I, I think it's also very important that we, that we uh, do this work to, to, together with them. I have a question I'm gonna put on my public health hat for a moment. Um, so how do you cope with the fear of the corona 
when people are going to these shelters or what are the shelters doing to dispel some of the some of this fear are they testing what what's going on Shana. i don't know i don't run a shelter i, I can tell you what i've heard is that they're taking okay. precautions they're doing social distancing they're keeping some families not the shelters are not like some shelters are but many of the shelters are not just one big building and everybody's in different rooms they're often staggered sites stag staggered sites like apartments so it may be that they keep uh -huh. Um, you know, families in each one, but I, I, I'm not, I don't work in that as much, so I wish I, I had more details, but there, and then there's a lot, the New York City, I'd say New York City, they're doing a ton of public service announcements saying that shelters are still open, and our hotlines are still open, and our legal departments are still open, so people know that things are still available, but so much is, people are so afraid to access services, but um, I, I, I wish I knew more, um, <laughs> but they are doing their best to, to keep to all of those, those social distancing, and um, health precautions. Yeah, I, I was just wondering like, how much of an, an impediment it is for people who might otherwise consider going to a shelter, but now they're afraid. They, you I know, it is. I believe it is. I mean, the other yeah. impediment right now is a lot of times the solution is, and there's so many things going on. You know, sometimes people move into a family member when there's like a heightened crisis, and people won't move into their elderly parents' home right now, right? Because people right, right. But, or, you know, in the past, they might consider getting order of protection where the abuser is excluded from the home, but they don't want, even that person's abusive, it's still the father or the mother, you know, it's still someone that's beloved to them. How do you put them out right now where there's really nowhere to go, right? So there's a lot, there are a lot of additional barriers right now. Um, right, right. I mean, yeah. many of us won't even go to the grocery store, right. so I can't imagine what it would yeah. be like, you know, to go to a shelter. Shlomit, did you want to yes, answer? No, I, uh, although, I, uh, thank God, uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have people. We almost had one woman that we have to, to refer to, to shelter, but it, it, she didn't want in the end. But uh, we, I, I, I was a challenge in, with it, but I'm, uh, in, but I'm in touch with the, with the shelters and know what's happening. The, the people here are not afraid. The problem is the everyday uh, fear of going to shelter. They weren't uh, uh, afraid to go in shelter because of the corona. They, okay. they thought that it's much safer there because the place is uh, under the the rules and the things are separately as they need to be so that was not a problem okay um let's see um we only have a few minutes left so i just thought first i'd give you the opportunity to say anything or add anything or whatever and then we can go to wrap up uh, do you want to add anything, Shana? And I'm sorry, I keep going to you first because you're on my screen right here. first. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I just want to make sure that everybody there know, everybody out there knows that we are open. Um, we pivoted right away. We um, mm -hmm. retrained all of our advocates who answer our hotline to do safety planning within quarantine, new protocols. Our hotline has expanded its hours during this time. Our legal department is available, taking intakes. Um, we're able to, to help people remotely, so it shouldn't be a barrier. And even our education program um, that goes into day schools and, and does public forums, we've gone to Zoom and we've been, been out there doing the work. So I don't want anyone to hesitate. If you know someone in need or you're in need of any services, we're here, we're open. Um, it hasn't, in, in that way, it hasn't changed. Um, and in many ways, it's more accessible, right? Because we're, we're always around. So please um, know that. Shlomit. Yes, Shlomit, I would like... What, what I would like to say is that the, the people there who are listening and seeing us and, and, and can tell their friends, I think the community should know that to believe if somebody is telling something about uh, having problems at home, when should minds, uh, uh, I know it from my clients and from other people that, you know, somebody is coming and say, I, I, a few months ago, I had a, one of my clients, who is a t he, she is a teenager, the father in Shabbat uh, took a knife against the mother and she ran to the rabbi and she said, you know what happened? He said, but I, I, I know your father, how come? At the moment he said, and I think he really, he didn't understand what he's saying. So she, the, it ends the relationship between her and with the, the, the thing between, between her and Kadosh Baruch Hu. But so, and, and sometimes it's very hard to believe. So the first thing that I want to say, 
listen and believe what they are saying. Maybe there are another details one have to, to look after and but but believe because it's very sometimes it, it you can't believe but you have to believe them because they don't have the 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 they, they don't feel that they can tell somebody because of those uh, uh, answers another thing is uh, it's it's a real problem so, so it's a real problem for domestic violence but there is a lot to do it's not like an illness that you know how to help uh, uh, the people to solve the problems. So give them hope. If somebody comes with a problem, say there is something to do, go to treatment and help them to believe that there is something to do. Another thing that I want to say that if you see or hear about a couple relationship which has control, fear, secret, shame, um, guilt, these are things which shouldn't be in couple relationships. So, so if you see one of these things, you should know that these are red signs and, and talk to somebody like Shana and like me and ask for advice how to help these people. Okay, I just want to remind you, of, oh, go ahead, Shana. I just want to echo what you just said, Shlomi, it really resonated with me where if you see something to be non-judgmental, it's not our job, to figure out all the details, it's our job to be there for people. And you know, the more we're able to talk about it, the more there we be there for people. People come forward, and there there are options. There is hope. There are resources in our own community that can help people move towards safety. Whatever choices they made, nobody needs to tell anybody what to do. But whatever choices they make, and we need to support them. And as a friend or a family member, that's what we can do. We don't judge. We don't we don't advise. We just be there. We hold it for them. And help them move. And it was really beautiful how you said that. There's really, there is hope. Yeah, there's hope. Okay, thanks. I just want to remind everybody out there who I can't see, but anyway, um, <clears throat> that if they want to visit the shalomtaskforce.org or friendsofyadzara.org for more information. And, um, also to remind everyone who's in the audience that they will get an, if they've registered, they'll get an email with a link to the recording of this session. It's obviously not ready instantaneously. So when it's ready, they'll get that email. And I want to thank Shana and Shlomit for participating. And uh, it was very, very interesting, especially, you know, for those of us who don't know all that much about domestic violence, it's really, really great. Thanks again. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.